You know, the uh, very obvious limitations of computers have been a great theme for humorists for uh, many years. Uh, a lot of you probably remember back in the 80s, Douglas Adams came up with the idea of the Babelfish. He needed to hear characters in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy to be able to all talk to each other just by coming from different planets. So unlikely was it that a computer could possibly do that. He came up with the idea of an animal that could do it, uh, which he then described in the book as being proof of the existence of God. Uh, other sources of humor in the limitations of computers was that great April Fool's joke by Google. Uh, they came up with the idea in 2009 of the Gmail autopilot which was their uh, April Fool's joke where they said uh, Gmail can now reply to your emails for you. Uh, now, never again will you have to worry about actually reading and replying to your own email. Uh, it's a very popular April Fool's. It hasn't always been jokes though. Um, back in the very early days of computing, Alan Turing imagined computers doing things very different to what they've ended up doing. He imagined that maybe they could create novel artworks perhaps by combining existing pieces and creating something like what this artist has um, represented here. Uh, the idea that maybe computers could actually create uh, back in the early days of computing was considered not such a far-fetched idea. Well, here's where we are now. In fact, in the last year, all three of the things I just described have actually come to pass. For example, this painting was actually created by a computer. It was created by a free online algorithm called deepart.io that any of you can go to and use. Gmail's autopilot is no longer an April Fool's joke. Your Gmail system will now automatically create replies for you if you use their inbox service on your Android mobile phone. It really works. And perhaps most amazingly, the Babelfish now exists. If you use Microsoft Skype Translator, it will translate your speech into any one of seven languages, including Chinese, in real time. How has this come to pass in just one year? How is it that now we can all be an artist and have access to Van Gogh, when these were things that we all knew computers couldn't possibly do? Well, I don't like to say I told you so, no, I do like to say I told you so. I really like to say it. I told you guys so. In fact, uh, 18 months ago, if you go to ted.com and uh, search my name, you'll find this talk where I introduced you to a new mathematical algorithm, or at least a newly effective mathematical algorithm called deep learning. And I described how deep learning was about to transform what computers can do forever. Now, I don't have time to go through the whole background of it now, um, but I'll give you a quick overview. Basically, deep learning is a way of doing machine learning that has no limitations as to what the machine can learn. So let's unpack that. What's machine learning? So machine learning refers to anything where a computer learns automatically how to solve a problem without you programming it by hand. So it came back all the way back to 1954 when this guy made this IBM mainframe play checkers at a level higher than the programmer by getting the computer to play against itself thousands of times and learn how to play checkers automatically better than its own programmer. Since that time in the last 60 years, it's come a very long way. It's used very widely. It's even been used a little bit in medicine. This is one of the most famous papers from machine learning in medicine. It's called The Computational Pathologist, where a group at Stanford took pathology biopsy slides and they got a bunch of expert pathologists and expert computer programmers to get together to come up with lots and lots of ideas of possible features of these slides that may be relevant to predicting the survival of somebody um, based on their slide. They came up with hundreds of examples and a large team of experts spent many years making this happen. Once they came up with all of these handcrafted features, they put them into a traditional machine learning algorithm, which turned out to be more um, predictive than the pathologists themselves at guessing how long the patient would survive. They also discovered new clinically relevant pathological features that had never known, been known before. So there's been some interesting advances even before this last year of great deep learning successes. But in the last year, as I described in my TED.com talk, something amazing has happened, which is now machine learning can be applied to anything and has unlimited capabilities. This perhaps first came to the forefront of public knowledge when the New York Times covered it in 2012 on their front page. 
Uh, they actually covered a project that I was heavily involved in back when I was the president of an organization of 400,000 machine learning practitioners called Cattle. So I had this kind of unique insight into a new capability, a new mathematical capability that didn't previously exist. And I thought, this seems like it could do anything. This will be more important than the internet in the economy and in society. And so I thought, what should I do with this information? The basic idea here is that rather than having to have many experts, whether they be pathologists or computer scientists or whatever, come up with these handcrafted features, deep learning automatically takes anything, whether they pick, be pictures, such as these pictures of my team, and they automatically create hierarchies of increasingly complex features. This is an example of three actual features from a real automatically learned face recognition system. It learns to find edges, the eyeballs, and then different types of faces. The most recent systems have hundreds of these layers. This means that we don't have to have any human experts come up with these features or program these features. It's all totally automated. So when I thought about what should I do with this information, I spent a year researching that question. And I came across an extraordinary statistic from the World Economic Forum, which is on this slide. What the World Economic Forum discovered was that there is less than one-tenth of the number of medical professionals that are required in the developing world to meet their needs. And they discovered that it will take 300 years to train enough of them to meet those requirements. This is not okay. And I thought, I wonder if deep learning could fill this gap. If we could, it could improve the lives of four billion people and also give us access to the world's largest industry. Diagnostics alone is worth about $2 trillion a year. So I started a company. Uh, the company is called Analytic. And it was really a very speculative idea, which is what would happen if we applied deep learning to medicine? Personally, I have no background in medicine myself. So this was a kind of a crazy idea for uh, somebody with a machine learning background to see what would happen if I tried my hand at medicine. I hired the best machine learning people in the world and the best medical experts in the world, and we built a system. We built a system that took millions of medical images and created a deep neural network using this deep learning algorithm. We then brought in new patient data and discovered that it could automatically do a wide range of different medical tasks. So we tested them out to see how good they were. For example, we tried out predicting the malignancy of lung cancer. And we discovered that this algorithm was far more accurate at both recognizing lung cancer and avoiding false positives than a panel of four of the world's best radiologists. We couldn't believe it. We couldn't believe how successful this idea turned out to be. We tried it again. And this time we tried something that radiologists told us was one of the toughest problems, which is finding wrist fractures. This wrist actually has a fracture. It's really hard to see, it's a tiny little bump. We ran our software over it and it automatically created this big red area, directing the radiologist's attention directly to the area of interest. And as you can see, it turned out that the accuracy of that algorithm is far more accurate than the published peer-reviewed papers by actual radiologists. So we're now in the process of publishing this in academic journals and of course in trying it out. So here's the exciting news the first place in the world that's going to get to use this is Australia. And that's because Australia's fastest growing ra uh, radiology company called Capital Health is going to be rolling it out across all of their clinics by June of this year. So this is going to be the first time ever that deep learning has been applied across end-to-end -end medical clinical uses in this way. It's going to mean that for Capital, they can expand their market rapidly and hugely without bringing on more people. And it means that their patients are gonna have much more accurate results, no more of these dangerous and expensive and stressful misreports we've seen in the past. Their radiologists will be working directly with this system. It's not just about what I'm doing with it though. What I really wanted to tell you is what you could be doing with this as well. Deep learning is allowing computers to do everything that in the past humans used to only be able to do alone. Reading, writing, understanding pictures, understanding videos, and so forth. 
Google has recently released a system called TensorFlow that allows anybody for free to download the world's best deep learning tools and use them to solve their problems. So perhaps now's a good time for you and your organization to try using this extraordinary new technology, just like Microsoft used it to create the real world Babelfish. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.